they always had a supportive role for them. And, and um, very many women uh, were, um, were, were uh, able to give unquestioning support, um, unconditional support. And uh, that helped their men, it helped their children. So I think overall, probably the women coped better. They were able to, to say that, look, this is, we are where we are and let's move on. A, a lot of men, having lost everything they've worked for, were, were um, not able to, to defeat the defeat. Welcome to episode number 10 of Expulsion at 50, a podcast created to commemorate the 50-year anniversary of the expulsion of Ugandan Asians. My name is Dola Vasani. In December 2020, I spoke to Rohit Sangvi from his home in London. I hope you enjoy listening to our conversation. So when you talk about your childhood, it's really interesting, the words that you use, you know, uh, joyous, freedom, no fear, fun, idyllic. So what made it that? We had, uh, uh, as I say, it, uh, it was completely, um, there was no anxiety, no, there was no worry. Nobody was concerned about um, what, where we were going. We were very well settled. Uh, we've been settled there for uh, three generations already in East Africa. Uh, we moved during holidays from uh, Kampala to uh, Mombasa, where I was born, to the beach, um, traveled around the country, traveled around both countries, Kenya and Uganda. We had relatives in Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania. Um, we could, in fact, my uh, parents sent my brother and I, when we were uh, eight and six, um, alone uh, from Kampala to Mombasa, a trip of more than 500 miles, uh, without any fear that anything would happen to us. Drive-in cinema we used to go to every Sunday to watch those Bollywood movies on huge, massive screens. There was a very good uh, uh, swimming pool at, at a place called Silver Springs that we used to go to. Um, the, the game reserves were just phenomenal. They were very, um, uh, uh, there were things that you, you did as, uh, you know, for, 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 for um, adventure. And uh, of course, the whole of East Africa was, was open to us. So it was very, very um, uh, great life. The school we went to was a, a phenomenally good school, very, very uh, uh, highly um, uh, productive school. It, uh, Produced some of some some very um, interesting uh, individuals. You say like sixty percent were Indians, Asians, and then forty percent were Black African. And how was it in terms of mixing socially? The, the African um, families lived in uh, different areas from the Indian families, um, but in school, within the school, within the school system. Uh, I didn't feel any um, uh, sharp division. We had a couple of racist teachers and didn't quite encourage the Africans as much as they encouraged the Indians. And the teaching composition? Almost, in, almost entirely Indian. Uh, there were a couple of um, uh, uh, white teachers who'd come in from the United States and, and from the United Kingdom. And there were a couple of African um, uh, uh, teachers. And in fact, um, one of my uh, African teachers I met again uh, when I went back to um, Uganda uh, 38 years later. We also had uh, highly committed uh, African students because they knew that um, their f families had made huge, massive sacrifices. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you, you're talking about, you know, that in, within the school, you know, you were mixing, and even though, you know, some of the, the, the African students were much older, you know, there was no problem in the classroom. And what about outside the school? School, we, we didn't mix with um, African um, families. And um, uh, therefore, the Indians stuck with themselves. And did you find that odd? Me, yes, particularly odd. You were, I was born into it, and therefore it didn't strike me as 
particularly um, odd at the time at all. Afterwards was when when I had grown a, a, a little bit more after coming to London. Uh, uh, back at the time, it all seemed to be pretty much um, pretty much normal. Freud's father, together with his mother, managed a successful gas cylinder distribution business in Kampala. How many people was he employing? Well, uh, probably around 15 or 16 people employed. Um, about seven or eight cars, vans to deliver those, those gas cylinders all over the country. What was your mother doing in, Ken in Uganda? She, wor she worked in the office with him. She, she she managed the the uh, uh, paperwork and the the uh, customers. So she managed the office. He went out all over the country. So, right, given what happened to Indian businesses in Kenya, did your parents anticipate something similar happening in Uganda? In 1962, when when uh, uh, independence was being negotiated, of course, the Indians were given the choice of either uh, adopting Ugandan citizenship or remaining British. The, most of them um, decided that they, it was better that they knew than the better they didn't, and therefore she opted for, for um, British citizenship. So in a sense, they saw it coming in 1962 because there was talk, as, as inevitably there would be, uh, of any um, colonized people that there would now be um, a program of Africanization. Writing was on the wall, but um, what we didn't know was the way in which it would happen and the speed at which it would happen. It happened was that uh, all of uh, our assets were taken. What was your, what were your parents thinking and saying? Well, they were, everybody was aghast. Uh, in fact, they could hardly process the shock of what had happened uh, within the short period uh, 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 within which they had to be out of the country. It was very, a very uh, anxious, tense time. And um, uh, my father was, in fact, was, was taking Valium for many months after coming to the United Kingdom. And do you remember anything particular about your mother's experience of that time? Yeah, she uh, she was less she, she was more stoical. Uh, she found solace in her religion, and she found solace in uh, supporting my father. She was an enormous support to my father, not only there, but once we were here, to for years afterwards um, in in the business that they set up here in this country. So, what had you heard about how things were in Britain? Um, they were uh, anxious, they didn't know how Britain would react. The, the news from Britain was terrible. Uh, Leicester, for example, started carrying advertisements in, in Ugandan papers to say, don't come to Leicester. Uh, Leicester is not the place for you. Please don't come. People who had arrived, uh, reports had been, had been carried back that they had been sprayed with, with noxious substances at uh, Heathrow Airport upon landing. The reception was hostile. Um, in uh, from London, the reports were, were not exactly uh, very um, very warm reports, and it was quite frightening. You know, were we going from from one place, the source, and into another place, the fire, and what was going to happen to us? So, that, to that extent, it was a very very worrying time indeed. Uh, it was it was in incredibly tense because you had to go through all those checkpoints down to Entebbe. Then uh, again, checkpoints and, and um, uh, armed soldiers uh, at the airport itself, and then into the uh, aircraft. And um, uh, when the when the aircraft itself took off, when it, it became airborne, uh, suddenly there was a collective kind of sucking of the air, as if as if um, uh, the whole the, uh, one single huge sigh of relief. Uh, people of my father's generation, my mother's generation, probably aged by five or ten years in the space of that three months. Okay, 
So you get in a plane in, in Tebe on, in Air France, and then you have this huge sigh of relief once you, once you get over the Ugandan airspace. And then where do you end up? Paris, to start out with. French um, uh, officials look very grumpy to, uh, to us. And um, it was the first experience of what kind of potential um, uh, welcome we were going to receive in London. 45 years of age, my mother 37 years of age, had to start uh, afresh, completely afresh in, um, uh, uh, in the United Kingdom with no backing whatsoever. Uh, accommodation made available by the government all over the, all over the country to spread the community out. Uh, but um, uh, my father at the time and uh, my uncle that absolutely refused, dead refused to accept any kind of government help. It, it just wasn't within, it, it wasn't within um, their contemplation that they could possibly accept any kind of help. Uh, in fact, it would have been uh, very, very difficult for them to have reconciled themselves with that. So they decided that they would settle where they wanted to and, and, and go to, um, uh, alone themselves. So that's why we ended up in South. So they never considered going to one of the refugee camps. I, I remember my father saying that, you know, I, I will, it'll be over my dead body that we accept any kind of help from anybody. We'll do it ourselves. I, I, I recall that and it was very, it was very staunch about it. And uh, I guess, you know, that was, that was the way he'd been, um, uh, he had formed his principles. What was like the biggest shock to you? It, I mean, we never experienced cold of that kind. Um, culture of the school, the culture of the country was very, very alien. Now, when you say alien, what, what does that mean? Well, the uh, uh, boys and girls were kissing in school. Never seen that. All over the place, there would uh, the, uh, there were bullies. Com uh, 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 Kalora was not like that. Kalora was a disciplined school. Here, it was you know everybody. Uh, uh, acting like like British school children do, do and did, and um, that was that was a bit of a cultural shock for myself. I couldn't at first easily understand all the accents on the English. Uh, the food was was absolutely um, horrible. You you couldn't swallow it and still think that you might live. It was not just not just bad. It was dreadful uh, gravy that looked like it had been made four five days earlier. All that kind of stuff. So, Roy, how was it for your parents? Did they ever speak about going back to Uganda? They had settled here. They, they uh, never, ever spoke again about going back to Uganda. Uh, just, just did not um, wish to speak about those times again. Uh, with their lives here. They started uh, with a small, small tobacconist and confectioner shop uh, and then grew into, uh, into acquiring, acquiring some properties, uh, a further business, and then uh, a number of other businesses. Uh, my brother and I were concerned once we had settled down in school. It took a couple of years to, to uh, um, become accustomed to the system here, but once we'd done that, then we, ca we carried on and, and slowly became British. The story of Ugandan Asians is one of triumph, tenacity and resilience. Many rebuilt their lives, showing extraordinary entrepreneurial spirit and self-reliance. They have also been cited as Britain's most successful immigrant community. But is that the full story? I have no doubt in my mind that um, a number of uh, uh, people um, died prematurely as a result of that experience. They came to this country, if it wasn't the shock of having to be uprooted and then sent out of, uh, the, uh, of Uganda, then it was a shock of um, racism and discrimination in this country. It was a shock of the, uh, at the same time, the liberalism of this country. People remember we were a conservative community. The generation was not able to, um, to make a success of their own lives. They, um, 
uh, they saw and rejoiced in the success of their children's lives. I think they had a resilience um, which got past the, uh, the, the inherent discrimination that they faced in this country. Our story is full of, full of hope. Uh, yes, we paid a, a big price, um, but in the overall context of the world, look, we, um, we escaped, um, we were not uh, murdered en masse, and um, we survived. And if uh, we could survive in that kind of way, then um, uh, anybody else who's treated in the way we were uh, has always got, got, got a hope and, and should have one. When I went back in uh, 2010, 38 years late, later, I uh, uh, went and um, did a tour of all the uh, areas where I had grown up. The Apollo Hotel, the hills, the um, Baha'i Temple, for example, uh, my school, I met the, the teacher who had taught me when I was 15. The city looked extremely crowded, but uh, it looked um, uh, very damaged. It looked as if, uh, as if it, had, it had gone through a, a kind of civil war. And ultimately, uh, standing there in the, uh, just outside on the corner of Parliament um, uh, Avenue and the main road, road where we lived, standing on that corner, uh, I wept. It brought back all my childhood memories. Um, it was uh, uh, it was um, it was where I had uh, I, I had not had to uh, to be mature at all, and uh, uh, I wept for everybody who suddenly, uh, with what had been visited upon them, had to find a new. Uh, I had lost their innocence. I'm terribly saddened at having to see Kampala in the way that it was compared to how I had um, experienced it. Um, it was almost as if it had been thrown back many decades uh, into, into a, uh, an unstructured uh, settlement rather than the capital city of, of our greatest African country. It's almost 50 years since we were expelled from Uganda. Um, I wonder, how do you think that experience has shaped your life? Uh, I guess everybody experienced um, their, um, their uh, expulsion differently. Everyone experienced their resettlement here differently. And those of us who went back, I suppose, experienced the... the um, uh, coming home, in a sense, differently too. Overwhelming um, influences in my life are British influences, so, since I was only 15 when I came to this country. Yeah, so when you, when you, you know, think back and, and look, reflect on your life and like, what, what do you feel have been the sort of the main lessons or the insights for you? Coming to the United Kingdom um, opened up my, my mind in a way that I could never have dreamt of. We were introverted as a community. We looked um, at ourselves, we hung on to uh, values um, from, from the late, I suppose, the late 19th century, which even people in India no longer uh, sort of, you know, subscribe to. I guess, I, I suppose we, we lost a lot of our innocence in that entire time. The whole of my life has taught me that, um, where, that first of all, it's taught me how not to be fearful. It's taught me to be fearless in terms of uh, whatever happens, right? There's always something else um, that we can do. It's taught me adventure. We can discover more of ourselves and more of the world. It's taught me love. It's taught me um, how to, how to, uh, how to uh, laugh at ourselves, smile at ourselves, and, uh, and welcome the future with open arms. Unless you keep the stories alive, and unless you have a good appreciation of them, then um, uh, the history would be lost. And if you lose your history, then a lot of what you are 
is also lost. A lot of why you are is also lost. Uh, and a lot of where you're going is also lost. Unless you, uh, unless you first looked in the rear, rear view mirror uh, to see what you're leaving behind, it's quite difficult to look ahead to see where you're going on the road. Uh, it's important for our children to know uh, what happened from not just from our African days, but also from our Indian days. Uh, it's important uh, for, uh, for them to uh, appreciate um, how this, this migration all over the world has happened, and not just by Indians, that's us, but by so many communities from so many other countries, the Chinese, for example. Uh, in, in fact, the, uh, people have hardly stopped moving in the whole of human history. And um, if we, as a microcosm, a, a small example of that vast history uh, can make uh, things interesting for our children, then I think we'd all become richer for the history of it. I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. Please feel free to post any comments you may have and do share it with your friends and family. Till next time, stay safe and thank you for listening.